I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And I say it all the time. I'll remind you, I'm a former prosecutor. When I was uh, in the world of private practice and, and uh, you know, in the world of inside the courtroom, not here on the outside looking in, but actually in there, um, I was trying cases as a prosecutor. And the thing about being a prosecutor is you can't win the case like 51 to 50 or 51 to 49. You can't win it uh, 60 to 40. You've got you've to present that overwhelming evidence, the beyond a reasonable doubt evidence. You've got to absolutely floor that jury with the proof that the person you are accusing of a crime is guilty of that crime. That's the burden they carry in each and every time. But I think a lot of times we lose sight of that. We think about, well, what do we think happened here? Did this happen or do we think that happened? No, that's not what it's about. It's about proving it in an overwhelming way. That's what you have to do. And with that in mind, another bad day in the Kimberly Potter case, I think, for prosecutors. Just another bad day. I mean, these prosecution witnesses, who are police officers, are being turned around on cross-examination and, and are giving the defense so much to work with. So much. Now, in, in a classic case that we cover here on Court TV, it's rare that, that the defense can make their case through prosecution witnesses because rarely do you have prosecution witnesses who are in the same line of work and, uh, you know, look at things the same way a criminal defendant looks at things. But the defendant here is a former police officer. This is someone who worked with these officers, was a union rep for these officers, uh, someone who, who has no real problems in the past. This is someone who's been a good police officer. But then that day happened, a really bad day. And now uh, prosecutors, again, trying to hold her criminally responsible, which means you've got to prove that criminal behavior beyond a reasonable doubt and eliminate all of these arguments that will be made by the defense including now this brand new argument that is part of this case, which is that the use of deadly force was actually justified. Take a look at what happened again today on the cross-examination of a prosecution witness. And if he keeps resisting after using the physical force of pulling on him, getting him out of the car, you can also use other forces like a taser, correct? Yes. if the car isn't moving. And if he still persists on it after the man is warned that I'm going to use a pacer and he keeps fighting and, so, and another officer is now in the car trying to stop him. Objection. I'm not done with my question. The objection is overruled. You may finish. And the other office, another officer is in the front seat laying over the passenger trying to stop this guy from going and he is ignoring the warnings, taser, taser. I gotta, I'm gonna tase you. You have a right to use deadly force to save that cop, that police officer that's lying over the seat, correct? It's in the the objection is overruled, you may answer. Potentially, yes, but I wasn't there. I am. But if that fact scenario, yes. You've got to save that officer that's laying over the seat, correct? Yes. If you're dragged down the street by this driver, if he gets away, that man's going to be seriously injured or dead. Fair statement? Could likely happen, yes. So what do you do as a prosecutor? I mean, this is your own witness. Well, you have to try to rehabilitate, and you go back on redirect, and you ask some questions to try to... Um, at least leave something in the minds of jurors that helps your side of the case. Take a look. Your answers to Mr. Gray, you've been telling us you had this video in your mind, not based on, are your answers to Mr. Gray's questions not based on what actually happened out there, but what little bits you saw plus what Mr. Gray added for you? I was trying my best to answer him based on what Mr. Gray was uh, explaining the the events that he articulated. You indicated that um, 
you know, training is not real life, correct? It's never exactly like real life. Is part of the training uh, trying to teach officers to think uh, in stressful situations in real life? Yes, we strive to try and really encourage critical thinking. We try and make training as realistic as we can, but we, we acknowledge we can't make training exactly like real life. And would a good police officer try to make good decisions under pressure? Object to that is leading, Your Honor, also opinion on the witness. Just ask. The objection is overruled. You may answer. I expect good officers to make good decisions. Okay, and, and that's helpful. But, it, but is it going to be enough to overcome officer after officer talking about this use of force? And it's coming out. These are prosecution witnesses. We haven't even gotten to the defense case yet. We haven't gotten to defense experts. That's when this stuff usually comes out that helps the defendant is when their, their expert comes in to testify. But they're getting it from fact witnesses testifying for the state. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who's joining us live from Minneapolis, Minnesota tonight. Chanley, great to see you. Um, you know, I think, it, I think it's a tough day. Uh, you don't need to give us your opinion about it. Um, but it seems to be a consistent pattern that we're seeing here where police officers are saying, yeah, under these circumstances, you can use that type of force. That's exactly right. We heard it on Friday with Major Johnson and the prosecution trying to even file a couple motions yesterday, wanting to strike that testimony and prevent the defense from, from eliciting expert type testimony from non-expert witnesses. But Judge Chu saying that the officers that take the stand can certainly talk about their training, their experience, the policy, and uh, under the circumstances, what would be policy here? And we've heard that over and over again. We haven't yet got to the cross-examination of the second witness of the day. So I'm anxious to see tomorrow, Vinny, what Earl Gray may be able to elicit from the use of force trainee of the Brooklyn Center Police Department. But just to give you some highlights of what this jury was really inundated with today, Vinny, Two witnesses all day long. It focused on policy training, uh, use of force, officer-involved shooting, really a crash course for these jurors to take in what officers at the Brooklyn Center Police Department have to know and be, really be experts on to go to work every day. The first witness right there, that's the commander, Garrett Fleslin. He told the jury that Potter was fully trained in her department policies as they evolved over her career. She repeatedly signed documents acknowledging the policies and an awareness of the warnings for weapon confusion. Also, they included her certification training on a new taser model just a month before this incident and on, of course, cross-examination. As you showed for everyone, that commander agreed that the deadly force could have been used under the circumstances described by Earl Gray, what Kim Potter was encountering with Dante Wright. But the second witness of the day, uh, Sergeant Mike Peterson, Vinny, he's this use of force instructor. He's certified, a certified taser instruction of the Brooklyn Center Police Department. He showed this jury an up-close look at a taser. I believe this jury has now learned more about a taser and how it works than they ever thought they would today this afternoon with this witness. In fact, uh, Peterson demonstrated with his own taser on his duty belt how an officer every day is supposed to conduct a spark test or a function test. Let's watch. I carry my taser on my left side. I'm going to draw it. As I draw it, I'm going to press both arc switches, one on the left side, one on the right side at the same time. It now illuminates my CAD, tells me that I'm in a function test mode. I can then turn on my taser. My CAD has changed colors. I know that it's now in a function test mode. And now I simply press my arc switch again. It runs through a five second uh, spark test. It's doing that on the CID, it's counting one, two, three, four, five. That's the duration of a cycle that we want somebody to end at. I check the status of it again, I disarm it, and I holster it. Thank you. 
And Vinny, while that moment may have sparked some life into this jury, according to Poll Reporter notes, after a long, tedious day where they even seem to be uh, checking out a little bit this afternoon, one juror particularly dozing off, according to Poll Reporter notes, but it, it did kind of drone on. Peterson went almost page by page through certifications, policies, and the personal record of Potter. So we shall see where his cross-examination leads tomorrow. Okay, there's one other battle today, a legal battle that um, it seems like the defense won involving uh, the Blakely issue, which it, it, it involves whether or not if she gets convicted, she gets an enhanced penalty. Uh, explain to us exactly what happened today. That's right. Prosecutors filed notice that they were going to seek aggravated sentencing if there is a conviction in this case, and that's done through a Blakely hearing. And the judge wanted to take up this issue to decide whether or not the defense wants this to be a bifurcated trial where she would be the one to determine if aggravating factors exist after a conviction or if the defense wants what is normally done, which is a jury to sit and decide whether or not there are aggravating factors. Well, the judge put Potter up on the record outside the presence of the jury and asked her about it. Vinny, let's watch. The two Blakely issues are that Defendant's conduct caused a greater than normal danger to the safety of other people as she fired into a motor vehicle in which a passenger was present and two other officers were in close proximity while the vehicle was operational on a busy public street. After defendant fired, fired the vehicle traveled down the street and struck an unoccupied vehicle heading in the opposite direction. That's the first alleged Blakely factor. The second one is that defendant abused her position of authority as she was a licensed police officer in full uniform who, has, who had seized Mr. Wright. And I'm sure that your attorneys have explained to you what Blakely is all about, uh, but those uh, issues would not be an issue at all if you were found not guilty of either charge. If you were found guilty of one or two of the charges, uh, the, the, your attorneys have indicated that they want me to decide whether these aggravating factors exist. The aggravating factors generally would um, allow me to impose a more severe sentence. Now, you have the right to have a jury decide these uh, aggravated, the existence of these aggravating factors. You have the right to call witnesses. You have the right to cross-examine any witnesses that the state would call. And I suppose you'd have the right to testify too if you wanted to on those issues. Uh, you'd be represented by counsel. Uh, and the jury would have to find beyond a reasonable doubt that these factors existed. And the burden would be on the state. Uh, is it your wish to give up your right to a jury trial on whether or not the two Blakely factors exist in the event of a guilty verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Vinny, so if there is a conviction, then Judge Chu would take up whether or not aggravating factors have been proven. If so, Potter could face up to 15 years. All right. So uh, it, it's fascinating to watch this whole back and forth and, and prosecutors really going for the jugular. They want, you know, the higher sentence in, in this case as well. Uh, interesting. All right. Chanley Painter, we'll talk a little bit later in the show. Uh, let's bring in the think tank tonight joining us. In Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor, law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling is with us. In Seattle, Washington, trial attorney Ann Bremner. And in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Albert Wunsch III. Great to see uh, everyone tonight. Michael Sterling, you're one of two former prosecutors with us tonight. But uh, what's, what's, can the prosecution salvage this case at this point with the um, supervising officer at the scene saying deadly force was appropriate at the scene. He said it. It's a he's a prosecution witness. And now the training officer has uh, backed it up to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, I think they can salvage the case. I mean, obviously, you've got uh, 
they're going to have conflicting opinions, but if they have an expert opinion who comes on, someone who's not affiliated with the actual police department that Kim Potter is affiliated with, and they can demonstrate that there might be some potential bias, I think they have the opportunity to salvage the case, right? Because the question becomes, you know, what did Dante Wright do that that, that caused you to 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 use deadly force? Uh, and and if you were using your taser and tasers to freeze the person up, you weren't gonna you weren't gonna be able to still get him out of the car. I've seen some analysis on CNN from uh, use of uh, deadly force experts who said that even in that situation, deadly force was not necessarily authorized. So I think that you know you can present a differing opinion. You can say, look, let's let's talk to some people who are impartial, third party validators who can potentially say that use of deadly force is not authorized. So they can salvage the case, but it certainly is not going well for them right now. No, and Bremner, much different situation than what happened in Derek Chauvin's trial. In Derek Chauvin's trial, um, and, and again, prosecutors weren't objecting to the opinions of police officers in that case because all the police officers who testified like the chief were saying that what Chauvin did uh, was not part of training, was, was, was not proper. Uh, so here, they don't have that situation. It, it seems like... The only one who's going to say this was uh, not deadly force is going to be their expert, much like there was just one expert for the defense in the Chauvin trial who said that. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you, you said it exactly brilliantly, Vinny. I mean, they've got a huge problem. And this is like the playbook from the Chauvin trial, but the problem is, is back then they kept, they put all their people on, all the police officers, to say that the use of force was not appropriate, and then they object to it in this case. And then they're going very aggressively after Potter, including acting, asking for enhancement and penalty, just like they did with Chauvin. But this is not the Chauvin case. This is the Potter case. And the fact that there's testimony that this was lawful use, a lawful use of deadly force, to me is the death knell in the prosecution. I don't think they can get past it. And they've got a very experienced police misconduct lawyer on the other side. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he's doing it masterfully. Al Wunsch, uh, should we be surprised that, that all of a sudden this trial isn't about, okay, yeah, you could use a, can you use a taser, can you not use a taser, but you've got prosecution witnesses saying the use of a gun, deadly force, was appropriate, was justified. Um, the, Officer Johnson actually said it, it, was, it was permitted under Minnesota statutes. And there but for the grace of God walk I. So you've got police officers there that are going to be looking at the situation and thinking to themselves, what if I was in this position? What would have happened to me? Where would things have gone? I mean, they're giving truthful answers, and that's the key thing here. Everything is being put forth as to what is happening on the street. You know, what they talk about in training and things like that, it's wonderful. We get trained as lawyers, but you don't really know what you're doing until you're in your first trial. And every situation with an encounter with an individual who has been pulled over is a new training lesson. There is no book that answers every question. And in this instance, she made a mistake. And there's no doubt she made a mistake. And I don't think that any police officer testifying thinks anything other than the fact that she made a mistake. Al, yeah, I have to correct one thing you said. You, you said it was it's kind of like a lawyer in your in your first trial. You don't know what you're doing until your first trial. You didn't see my first trial because I had no idea what I was doing uh, before it started, in the middle of it, and at the end. Somehow I won, but I had no idea what I did. Okay, so M Michael Sterling, let me ask you a, a big picture question because I think Ann sort of referenced this. Um, are prosecutors overcharging this case? Are they going for the jugular in a case where they shouldn't necessarily be going for, for the jugular? Yes, the shooting happened in the middle of Derek Chauvin's trial, but this isn't Derek Chauvin's trial. You know, Vinny, prosecutors overcharge cases all the time. Like, that is what they do, right? They, you know, there used to be a saying amongst prosecutors, right? One charge, one conviction. In other words, if I can get you with 10 charges and I can just get one conviction, even if, even if it's on the most minor of those charges, then I feel like I've scored a victory, right? Uh, you know, and... And, look, but it's, and it goes beyond the charges, though. They're going for an enhanced penalty here. Like, this is, 
I hear the guidelines. Here's what the legislature says. Okay, you do this. This is the, what your penalty should be. They're saying, no, this case is so bad, it's got to go above and beyond. Yeah, I mean, maybe they know something we don't know. Maybe they're trying to, you know, prosecutors have endeavors that they that go beyond that particular courtroom, right? So, you know, when you look at the reasons prosecutors bring charges, oftentimes it's to prevent it, things like this from happening in the future. It's re to prevent future crimes, it's to increase training. So they may have particular endeavors that they're trying to accomplish by going for the enhanced charges. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, uh, 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 you know, uh, impugn, you know, what they're trying to do, because there may be some bigger picture here to make sure that accidents like this don't happen in the future, because the profession of policing is one of those things that we have to stop sort of making excuses for and say, oh, just a bad apple or just an accident. You know, we wouldn't do that for pilots. Uh, oh, just a bad accident, just crashed a plane into uh, a mountain. It, it happens every now and again. We have to stop doing that for police officers. Okay. The jury uh, will get the case, it looks like now, perhaps next week uh, in, in Minneapolis.